five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hello, space enthusiasts. This week's guest is my friend Aravind Ravichandran, previously of PWC Space Consulting Group, and now working on his own at TerraWatch Space. He is an expert on Earth observation, but I think you will find his perspectives on the space sector and space business very insightful in general. He also has his own space podcast, the TerraWatch Space Podcast, where I was a guest just a few weeks ago. As always, feel free to email us your questions or comments on the episode at spacebusinesspodcast at gmail.com or post them on our Twitter, podcast underscore space. If you do enjoy the show, please leave us a review or rating on your favorite podcast platform so more people can find the podcast. Now here are a couple of short messages from our sponsors, then please enjoy my conversation with Aravind. My name is Raphael Rodkin and I'm an investor and advisor to space companies. Just as a reminder, this podcast is for informational purposes only and nothing should be taken as investment advice. This podcast is sponsored by Nanoavionics, a satellite manufacturer and mission integrator. Their technologies enable many space companies worldwide to offer services that improve life right here on Earth, such as providing global connectivity, conducting Earth observation, or contributing to scientific discoveries. Check them out, and also check out my episode with the CEO and co-founder. Sadly, I am not a rocket scientist, but I am an alumnus of the International Space University. ISU offers a number of educational programs about space worldwide. Check them out at isunet.edu. Hey, I'm here today with Aravind Ravi Chandran. How are you doing? Thanks, Rafael. I'm doing fine. And you? Excellent. And I was really looking forward to doing this because, funnily enough, of course, we recently did it the other way around. Mm-hmm. And you know, I think it was a very good, well, at least I thought it was a very good episode and I had a lot of fun doing it. So <laughs> now it's Absolutely, my turn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, your definitely. turn on the other side of the table. And for people who haven't seen it, so I mean, We'll talk about your activities and the various things you're doing in a in a minute, but one of them is the Terror Watch Space podcast. So you just want to talk a minute about that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, it's just something that I started um, beginning of this year. And, you know, I had a mission to kind of start a podcast that people can listen to, especially those who don't know much about the space industry, to get a sense of what's going on in the industry. And, you know, sometimes they just associate space with, uh, you know, NASA, space exploration, and they don't really understand what are the different domains of space. So I thought it'd be a nice way to, you know, have conversations with people who are experts in the space industry and kind of explain that to people outside the space industry and also within the industry i think it's good to have some fundamental discussions about you know where the industry is and how it's going every now and then and that's also what i do with the podcast that's great and people can find it i think pretty much on every major platform and again it's called the um, the terror watch space podcast mm-hmm. and we'll, we'll put it into the, the episode notes but erwin this is really only just one of the activities you're currently engaged in uh, you used to be a space focused consultant at pwc if i remember correctly mm-hmm. And then, and then you left, and now you're doing a bunch of different space-related things. Can you tell us what you're what you're up to, besides the podcast? Sure. You know, I entered the space industry about five years ago now, and uh, I did the International Space University, the master's program there. And that's kind of how I entered into the space industry. And before that, I used to work in software. So I used to be, you know, also on the coding side and then on the business side, doing some sales for a software startup um, before going into the space industry. So, you know, I was not really coming into the space industry knowing what I was going to be doing. Um, Clearly, I knew that I was not going to be a, you know, rocket scientist or a propulsion engineer or going to be working on exotic missions of NASA or ESA or anything like that because I don't have the background to go the, go with it. So what I decided was consulting was the best way to go into the industry uh, knowing what I know. So that's kind of how serendipitously, you know, the PwC opportunity came my way. Uh, they were putting together a space team and, you know, I got in there and started working uh, as a senior consultant within their space practice. Pretty small team. And that's kind of where, you know, I learned everything that I know about the space industry, that and ISU. So there, you know, I was working on, you know, a bunch of uh, assignments for ESA, for the European Commission, for a number of private companies. And what we did was both on the policy side also on the strategy side, uh, working on a lot of assignments, um, advising, you know, clients on go to market. And if it's ESA, advising ESA on, you know, where to put their money and what kind of missions to invest in. Um, and also, you know, 
got to work on a couple of due diligence assignments uh, for investors for a few acquisitions in the space industry. So over the course of the three years I was with PwC, I, I got a sense of how the space industry, you know, kind of worked and organized, it, organized itself. And you know that space is you know, still a very nascent industry and very much in its early stage. So during the confinement, I kind of thought about what I wanted to do next. And I decided to leave PwC to to kind of try out and do a lot of a uh, bunch of things, uh, you know, one of which ten, uh, turned out to be the podcast. And then I started a newsletter to kind of understand what's going on in the space industry and also, you know, convey it to people who want to know. So, you know, that's what I'm doing now. I do a podcast, I do the newsletter, and also I continue with my consulting, um, you know, working with space agencies, startups, investors on, you know, on projects that I like and Earth Observation tends to be kind of my area of interest, um, which is where I spend a lot of time also in PwC and also in the last year. But uh, but yeah, that's that's basically how I look at it. There's the consulting side, which is basically the revenue generation side. And then there's the, you know, the passion projects like the newsletter and the podcast. Yeah, I'm also thinking of, you know, other things that I can do to kind of, you know, convey what I know already to, to people outside. Because five years before, I'm thinking, what would I like to have if I had if I wanted to get into the space industry uh, today, what would I have liked to have five years ago? That's kind of what I'm thinking about now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Have you ever considered uh, during that time becoming an entrepreneur in space? Uh, definitely. I think one of the reasons I left PwC was I thought, you know, I, I figured out, you know, a solution to work on. So I did work on it for a couple of months. Um, and then I realized that, you know, entrepreneurship in space, is, again, it was an earth observation, you know, it was not trying to build another, um, you know, satellite constellation or a launcher. So it was mm -hmm. still an Earth Observation downstream company. Worked on the idea for two, three months. You know, as you know, in, in Earth Observation, you know, there's, uh, it takes a lot of time before product market fit. And with my situation, I was not in a financially speaking and also logistically speaking, not the best time to be in terms of uh, starting a company. So I decided to leave that. Uh, I don't know if I'll get back to it. I think I'm kind of a person who, uh, who likes to work on a lot of things at the same time. I think entrepreneurship requires mm -hmm. Uh, for you to focus, focus. on yes. yeah, one thing Ideal at the same focus. time and yeah i think i need to kind of learn that uh to see if it's possible in the future but right now i think it's it, it's great um you know doing what i'm doing you know i finished working on a, a lunar exploration project for esa recently and then i worked on another earth observation project for esa and i worked on another due diligence that was for uh, satellite communications you know learning a bunch of things and you know doing what i'm doing now it's it's great and i think i have a lot more to learn before i can you know make my own plunge into entrepreneurship i guess the nice thing is while you're, while you're doing this you get to see a lot of different things you know which can ultimately become inspiration or or give you ideas mm -hmm. exactly is it and and when you were at pwc you know when when one hears and thinks about companies like large consulting companies like pwc one sort of i think automatically thinks about big corporate clients or like you said government clients has that sort of continued when you were when you became a free agent i, I guess it has to some extent because you just mentioned isa but or are you also now getting more say startup clients yeah no absolutely well to be honest if i have to be a consultant for myself uh, i know that the you know the total address market for consulting in space industry is not that big yeah. and the addressable market uh, for me is not going to be the big clients because they will tend to go to the PwCs and the, and the Deloitte's of the world and the Euroconsults of the world and I think what I tend to focus on is my startups, investors and sometimes you know the institutions and the institutional projects are usually more opportunistic because I have a network and we kind of you know have, have a chat and that's kind of how assignments happen but I think my core focus is uh, startups and investors. Uh, investors is especially outside the space industry who want to get in mm -hmm. and, you know, and they want to invest in an IoT startup or a satellite IoT startup or an Earth Observation startup. They are kind of, I think, spoiled by all the market reports that come out saying it's, you know, it's going to be a multi-billion dollar industry mm -hmm. and they wanted someone to take a realistic, I think, outlook. And I think they come to me for that. So the investors is one category and then startups is the other, especially Earth Observation startups, because it's, it's kind of a, a space that... It's it's going towards a boom um, because this year there's been so many deals in Earth Observation and I think Earth Observation startups also want some advice on, you know, go to market and, you know, the kind of uh, verticals they can target. You know, as you know, a lot of Earth Observation startups start with, okay, we have this technology and what can we do with it? As opposed to, we have this problem, how can we solve it? And if Earth Observation can play a part in it, you know, different approaches. So I kind of tend to advise them as well. So startups and investors mm -hmm. are kind of the primary category and uh, institutions 
and the big clients happen opportunistically. Mm -hmm. And you work with with investors, and I think, as you mentioned, you're probably less talking about specialized space investors and more about sort of generalist investors. And any interesting sort of observations in terms of I don't know common misperceptions they may have, or any other sort of you know interesting things you've seen in your conversations with investors, how they see the space sector? Yeah, I think what is true is I don't know if it has happened. Uh, I think I should be lucky because what has happened in the last year is uh, I have had more conversations with non-space investors in the last year since I left PwC than you know I had while working at PwC. So probably it's another serendipitous thing that happened is that you know last year there's just so much interest in space tech. I think in the context of the pandemic as well, I think investors uh, had the chance to look at or understand the space industry a little bit more. So the interest is definitely growing. I can I can say that because mm -hmm. the conversation that I've been having with you know comp with investors who have yeah not even a deep tech company in their portfolio but they are interested in you know getting into space tech. I think that's a really interesting trend that they want to focus on space tech. They have been investing only in consumer apps and now suddenly they want to get into space tech. I don't mm -hmm. quite understand the reasoning behind it, but you know that's good for the space industry because there's probably going to be more funding available. The biggest misperception for me is their understanding of the market is very one-dimensional. So, you know, they either look at it as one layer or two layer, and that's good to start out. Uh, so you can just think of space as just space, or you can think of it as infrastructure and applications, um, mm -hmm. as, as some investors do. But I think if you want to go and invest into a, a startup, you know, whatever it is, if it's a small component supplier, or a propulsion company, or an earth observation downstream company, you need to go, you know, one or two more levels deeper than that. And I don't know if, if the non-space investors kind of see it like that, you know, like I said, like Earth Observation, if you take an example, yes, it's going to be a multi-billion dollar market, but not all startups are going to, you know, be, become uh, valued at, you know, tens of billions. It's just not possible. But that's kind of what you get if you look at it as, uh, you know, a simplistic view of the market. You need to go, you know, two, three levels deeper. And I don't know if, you know, if they're doing that. But, you know, that's kind of why they, they approach, you know, consultants or, you know, kind of try to get to know a little bit more about the market. And and I think it's going to change, you know, it's, it's just because it's such a nascent industry that, you know, even the different domains of space are not being fully understood. Mm -hmm. uh, given that, I come outside the space industry, I can say that, you know, my understanding was equal to my understanding five years ago was equal to their understanding today. Like they understand that you can do, you know, IoT from space, internet from space, but, you know, realistically, when it comes to the investor, they look at two, three important KPIs. What kind of, you know, annual recurring revenue does this startup have? These are all terms that I don't know if the space industry is fully used to, um, especially looking at, uh, especially if you're an investor coming from the software side, these are the KPIs that you're fully used Used to and they come and approach the space industry the same way and i don't know if um, if they're getting the results that they're supposed to get you know of course if you look at a if you look at an earth situation company or even a, a satellite manufacturing company you cannot evaluate it based on annual recurring revenues and you know you mm -hmm. kind of need to have new kpis so those are also some interesting conversations that i've been having with investors yeah I'm, i'm i'm not surprised and i guess you know you can spin it in a, in a sort of an optimistic or in a pessimistic way sort of like on the pessimistic note it seems sometimes like just been so much excitement about things like like launch companies and you know which which i basically ascribe to and i think you you were kind of getting at some of that that a, a lot of people are saying well launch companies are the infrastructure layer of the space economy and that, that of course is correct mm -hmm. that still doesn't mean that we need like 200 of them and and b that you know rocket launch is just a very viscerally appealing yeah. <laughs> activity now If I had to spin it the positive or the optimistic way, I guess uh, you were mentioning software a few times now. And so if I, if we take the, and we're going to talk about Earth observation in detail in a moment, but if you take the sort of like the downstream side of Earth observation downstream, you know, of course, you know, but for our listeners, meaning that you basically um, do value added analysis of the mm -hmm. satellite imagery, I guess that is, that is the closest you get in the space sector to some of the activities that many investors may have already invested in right mm -hmm. and do, do you see that do you do you see that and do you hence see that maybe they are they are the investors already are more familiar and they kind of get more what's going on definitely i think uh, especially if they're approaching you know uh, uh, earth observation companies that's kind of how their line of focus tends to be but if they're looking at other parts of space you know all their past investments or past theses or past kpis don't work anymore because yeah. it becomes hard tech deep tech and uh, there are of 
course, some investors who've done some deep tech investments before, so they have some comparison to go back to. But I think a lot of investors coming in, especially if they are used to foc- uh, focusing on the software side of things, space tends to be a bit daunting, which is also why mm. uh, we haven't seen so much uh, investment happening from the non-space side. But I think it's changing. Uh, just in the last uh, year or so, there's been so many deals in general in the space industry. And the kind of involvement you see of non-space investors has been great. And and that's where I think, you know, a narrative or a shift in narrative is probably required in the space industry. So instead of just saying investing in space, I think there should be like narratives around different parts of space, you know, looking at it from a, from a use case point of view. So there needs to be some investments in, in you know, the cislunar side. And I think that's mm-hmm. where the Artemis played a huge part in kind of fitting that narrative. And for the downstream side, for, you know, the value added side of space, there's probably no narrative today. You know, I think climate tech is one narrative that's been building on climate tech, green tech, sustainability. So, you know, if you have that narrative around, I think investing becomes easier because then you can start evaluating companies around, okay, how much does this company actually contribute to, you know, climate or um, sustainability or green transition, etc. So the narrative is kind of what's missing. I think that would probably help them, you know, approach the space industry easier because, you know, if you're then a software uh, investor, it's easier for you to approach climate tech narrative than a cislunar narrative. You know, you don't even need to look at these companies because they are too far away from your thesis. So that's kind of something that I hope that can happen over the years because it's important to kind of portray the industry in a nice way outside because if, if we just say space and space tech, you know, it, it could be still daunting for, for a lot of folks. And I don't know if we can kind of extract all of their insights. And, you know, we for sure know that their insights are needed uh, in kind of getting mm-hmm. the space industry developed, you know, whatever investor that invested in industrial IoT or automotive or, you know, biotech, all those insights in terms of, you know, getting the business model out can be used for space. And the same thing with the Earth Observation and software, all the SaaS insights that invest- investors might have, I think the Earth Observation startups need them because, you know, it's it's an industry, you know, still just starting to develop and, you know, all those investors coming in can be useful in a very strategic way. That's why I always view investment as not just funding, which is great, but then also the, the strategic insights part uh, is also very useful. And I think that's where uh, the non-space investors can come in and play a very important role. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And it's, 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 it's interesting. So, I mean, obviously, I think people know that my main activity besides besides doing this year with you is um, is running a, a early stage space investment firm, a venture capital firm. And of course, we say we are specialized space investors, but sort of more recently, I have found myself, my partners as well, we found ourselves to basically say, yes, we're space investors, but what does that actually mean? And we sort of typically split into two things. And one is, yes, we invest in things that enable activity and businesses in space, so like you know, rocket companies, mm-hmm. the obvious example. But then the other really big part is um, we invest in things where you leverage space technology for some specific use case, mm-hmm. um, which at the moment tends to be on Earth. And I think this is what you you were getting at, right? Sort of making this this connection back to, like you mentioned, climate, but it could be you know other other use cases as well. By the way, like creating those narratives and making that connection and sort of explaining that it's not just space in an isolated way. Like in your mind, whose responsibility is that? Is that on the startups? Is that on the investors? Or is that on people like us with podcasts? Or who should be doing this? I think we have a very important role to to play in that you know the well you know you can call us the communicators or the outreach folks um how we want to call that uh, call us it's 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 kind of you know up to us a little bit but then i think majority of them tends to be with the startups but also you know in a in a rational way uh, not all space startups or climate tech startups you know mm-hmm. you can kind of have um you know a direct impact or an indirect impact or an induced impact you know three types of impacts not all of them can be called climate tech company i mean of course space is very important for climate but you know is it direct indirect or induced we don't know so i think we need the the startups need to play the um play the you know the communication right but but i think it's it's a combination i think we all have to do that part and also as you know investors within the space industry it's also you know within their realm to kind of get the message across 
because it's it's important to get that message to 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 folks who are interested and who don't know where you know where to go uh, and you know if the startup says that they fit into one narrative you kind of need to have the let's say the expert pool uh, for them to rely on which could be us you know to kind of have a sense of you know hey, they they call themselves you know climate tech are they really you know doing something for the climate or is this just a buzzword that they are having yeah. in their pitch tech you know <laughs> which tends to happen quite a lot so i think it's up to us to kind of send the right message as well yeah fully agree okay let's try to make this a little bit more tangible and let's let's you know pick earth observation just because of course it is the sector you know so well so let's talk a few minutes about about earth observation and let's maybe sort of divide it up in a typical way sort of upstream downstream and then there's also a part i guess um, about uh, distribution which we can talk about what don't we start with the upstream and so again just to explain the terminology to to people who may not be familiar with it upstream basically is where an earth observation company owns the hardware so they actually have satellites with sensors with some types of sensors that generate some type some type of data um Erwin, so in the in the upstream side of things, what, what do you think is most interesting right now? So for example, could be specific sensor types or are we fully covered there already? Um yeah, no, just just on the on the different layers. I just published a post recently about how I look at the Earth observation market and how we can look at it differently, especially for an outsider. Mm-hmm. Um maybe upstream, midstream, downstream is it's a little too technical. So I, I attempted at kind of explaining it in three layers, which is still pretty similar, but in words mm-hmm. that they might understand better, which is acquisition, dissemination, and then intelligence. So three layers. So acquisition is where everything to do with space and satellites, where you build a satellite, <laughs> integrate it, um, you know, launch it. And I think that's where the, you know, the line of the space industry stops. Um, and then I think the geospatial industry takes over in the dissemination world, the geospatial and the infrastructure uh, folks like AWS and Google, and <laughs> they take over in terms of disseminating the data and offering a uh, a way for people to access and play with data and, you know, offering an environment where they can come, access the data, play with it, and then, you know, develop applications if they want. So that's the dissemination layer. And then the third layer, what I call the, yeah, the intelligence is, you know, where all the value is extracted from from satellite data. So I kind of approach it in, or I try to approach it in this way to see, you know, how the result is with uh, people who, you know, who are new to Earth observation. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's mm-hmm. kind of how I, I started like it. it. Yeah, it's it's. Um, I think I think I mean it. It seems to mirror basically acquisition would be upstream and mm-hmm. dissemination would be well midstream or something like that, and then mm-hmm. um, the analysis would be the the downstream. But I I do see your point of having terms which are more user friendly. So I like that. So let's let's stick with your terms. <laughs> <laughs> no, that that's just an attempt. You know, it's just uh, some people I've talked to investors and they've kind of interchangeably confused downstream and upstream. And I was like, okay, you know what? Let's try to see if there is another word. But yeah, going back yeah. to your question on the acquisition side or on the on the upstream <laughs> side, I think there's basically two main trends that I see. Uh, one is on on verticalization or how I call everything is becoming vertical specific, even the collection of data. Um, earlier, it used to be very horizontal. Well, it still is quite horizontal. There are a lot of horizontal companies. By horizontal, I mean they have a lot of multipurpose data that they can use for different industries. But in order to solve a specific problem within a within an industry, you probably need to have a you know specific data, and you know by that I mean infrared data, you know, in a specific spectrum or emission data, which is in another spectrum. So I think the this is starting to come up a lot more. Uh, even the companies that have been funded this year, you know, there have been a lot of infrastructure, uh, radio frequency monitoring, and, uh, and yeah, emission companies um, as well this year coming up. Verticalization is, is one big trend that I see because with the horizontal uh, companies like Maxor or Planet or Airbus or, you know, whoever it is, they they supply, you know, a type of data that's that's going to be very useful in solving a problem but it's probably not going to be you know enough to solve a very particular problem and you may need to have Mm -hmm. a combination of two or three types of data and that's where you know the specific sensors uh, come into play Um, and we have already started seeing a lot of new sensors uh, coming in and, and i think that's going to continue as well as you know we see eo being useful useful across uh, different sectors 
So that's one trend. And the second trend I see, which is more in the long term, is more on the on-orbit processing side, because clearly the amount of data that we're going to gather from all these satellites is, is going to be incredibly huge. Well, that's good news for AWS and Google and mm -hmm. uh, all those uh, Azure, Microsoft Azure, all those players, because, you know, all these terabytes, uh, uh, petabytes, I don't know what's the next layer, exabytes of data needs to be stored and processed somewhere, right? So it's, it's a cash cow for them. So they're going to be happy about it, but clearly it's not very efficient. So I think edge computing is the second big trend that I see. Well, it's starting. I don't think we're there yet, but that's more in the long term uh, where we start to process uh, data on orbit and only, you know, send the data down. You know, the simplest use case being cloud-free uh, data. Mm -hmm. You don't really need to store it. It's basically junk, right? Unless there are algorithms that are there to yeah, remove the clouds. I don't know if that's possible, but, uh, you know, see through clouds from the imagery and gather insights from them. I don't know if that's possible, but clearly these are all like data that doesn't need to be stored. And you as a customer or a satellite operator, you don't need to pay for that data because it's mostly useless data. So mm -hmm. instead mm -hmm. of sending that data down, you can just, you know, process it on orbit. So that's two things that I'm kind of looking forward to, verticalization and, and uh, on orbit. That's, that's yeah, that's, that's kind of how I'd... Uh, Put it for now. Do you see this is the on orbit processing starting to happen? Yeah, there are a couple of startups that are sending, uh, you know, demonstration payloads. And I think ESA already has a mission that was demonstrated last year, if I'm not mistaken. And they have, uh, ESA have plans for a couple more satellites this year, uh, sorry, in a couple of years. Uh, but, um, but yeah, it's still in the, you know, in the R&D stage. Uh, I don't know how much we can do uh, in terms of, you know, processing on orbit, but, you know, we know that computers are getting smaller and they can process a lot more um you know example our smartphone so uh, if we can do that in our smartphone and i think what we need to figure out is putting it up in space and getting it to work uh, and transmitting the data down so you know some te technical let's say challenges to solve but um but i think in, in a fi about five years time i would imagine that you know we start processing data in orbit uh, either in you know because there are companies like cloud constellation i believe which are putting data centers in space mm -hmm. um, i think mm -hmm. we can argue about their uh, use case uh, that's a separate conversation but you know if you have them and satellites collecting data it's not you know impossible to imagine that you know the processing might some process Processing might happen in orbit, not everything, and you know the remaining happening on Earth. So you know that's that's a nice thing to look forward to because people don't need to see. Uh, you know, right now it's overwhelming with the amount of data from different sensors. It's a bit crazy acquiring so much and storing it. So I think this might you know make it easier, at least from an end user point of view. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I agree with you. The, the whole on-orbit processing is, is very interesting. And there's the aspect you mentioned, which is sort of that at the moment we are collecting a lot of data that we don't actually need and so there's no reason to keep it and then pay the downlink cost and everything i guess there's also other few use cases where it's really time sensitive and you actually want to analyze the data as quickly as possible you know whether that's you know wildfires or missile detection or things like that so it's, it's certainly something to we're going to be watching with interest let, let me throw another couple of i don't want to call them necessarily trends but yeah potential trends at you and see what you think so one of them is what i would just call um hosted payload so you know upstream Sorry, um, acquisition EO companies uh, instead of, I mean, it seems traditionally everybody wants to do their, their own constellation, right? And obviously costs a lot of money. Um, I think now you are starting to see some models where in theory, you could just have your sensors as a hosted payload on somebody else's satellites. And some companies are even I think, starting to market that like um, I think Spire is. How do you see that? that trend is that is that real will that work i think it might work especially if you know especially when companies like spire start to realize that you know eo can be done EO at the end of the day is just a small payload and given the miniaturization of that payload and uh, i cannot completely speak about the you know the the power requirements of um, mm, sure. specific eo payloads but given that some sensors are going to be pretty standard and normalized um, i think that can pick up especially you know the the spire aurora tech uh, model is pretty interesting because you know you see a new kind of stack building up uh, in space because earlier everything used to be vertically integrated and in-house um, like planet does and 
Aurora, on the other hand, is kind of just doing the payload and giving the space part to, you know, the space company uh, like Aspire. And again, I see that being good for the, the vertical companies that come into space because, you know, one example is uh, that comes to mind is Tomorrow.io or formerly called Climacell. They decided to make their own radar satellites because they believed that they wanted some data from space to, to make their weather prediction better. It's basically an opposite case of that because they, had, they are a company that can raise funds. They they have the team kind of work on the space side of things, so yeah. they decided to do it themselves. And then you have folks like Aurora. You, they realized, you know what? We are good. We are remote sensing specialists. We are good at knowing what space data can do for wildfires. So let's stick to that and let's outsource the space side of things. So I definitely see that carrying on because space is expected to become, you know, just another type of. Um, I think um, I had Guillermo on the on the podcast, and you know, you know him, and I liked what he said about it's it's space. Space is just where people do business, just like internet is where people do business. So if that, you know, if you go with that statement, uh, you should have kind of a supplier who can take care of the space side of things, and you can worry about you know the problem that you're solving. So that's kind of how I would approach it. Um, but I mean, it depends on how much uh, demand and you know market uh, there is for the Earth observation data. At the end, you know the intelligence layer, because if the intelligence layer does not uh, make money, then then yeah, I don't know. If, if this is going to continue, but I think that you know there is a path forward for um, you know EO to become that this multi-billion-dollar market we keep talking about, and you know most of it's going to come from the the intelligence layer. So as long as yeah, as long as there is um, you know demand and people buying EO-based products, uh, yeah, this trend of outsourcing the space side, so to say, uh, is going to continue. I think that's where the hostel payloads, hostel payload service uh, becomes pretty interesting because anybody now who's interested in solving a problem can just um you know work on their problem and not worry about the space side of things okay and just to finish up on the on the acquisition layer so a- another thing which i've come across not very often but every once in a while you you see a startup that is sort of pitching it is is trying to do something in 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 very low earth orbit or you know, called vlio right so let's call it that i don't know so like 250 kilometers or below, which, you know, has some technical challenges because I mean, those, those low orbits decay very fast. So your satellite literally falls out of the sky unless you do certain things. Um, on the other hand, people then argue that, you know, you could have um, interesting use cases in terms of better re- spatial resolution and so forth. Is that something you've come across? Is that something you think is on the horizon or do you think it's, it's mostly a buzzword? No, actually, as a matter of fact, I did work on a due diligence recently for an investor on a, on a VLEO startup. And basically, I think the technology is great because you know you you're basically you know having a solution that's working very very close to earth orbit guaranteeing the spatial resolution and the argument comes you know i think it's more of a technical argument or um, a market argument as well the technical argument being you know yes it's 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 great in technical argument not in the space side but more on the software side how much spatial resolution is actually needed in order to get your model to train better because at the end of the day all the spatial resolution um i mean on, i'm not talking about the military side i'm sure that uh, on the defense side they'll be super super happy to have a direct spatial resolution 10 cents centimeter, a mm-hmm. five centimeter, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then on the commercial side, do we really need that 90, 95% accuracy in terms of object detection? Or can you just do it with 30 centimeter or 25 centimeter? Can you make the image better in, you know, having better algorithms to kind of make object recognition easy on an image? Because at the end of the day, that's the argument for these companies is if you take the defense segment outside, the argument for them is higher spatial resolution is great because you can recognize a lot more objects on the imagery without having a lot of training algorithms etc so yeah the technical argument is does it really is that accuracy needed in solving the problem whatever problem they are solving and mm-hmm. that's where the market demand comes into the picture is there a customer who really wants it or can you make do with 25 centimeter imagery with whatever insights it gives and make a product out of it because at the end of the day that defines the need for this uh, type of satellites or this type of orbit uh, because of the end user's problem you know is okay with uh, 25 centimeter imagery and all he cares about is okay what do i need to do with the 25 centimeter imagery in order to include it into my workflow then you know then it's a it's a different conversation because then you go very downstream and see 
what, what the demand is coming in from the customer side, um, as opposed to what's available from the technology side, which, you know, going back to the biggest challenge in EO is the technology first approach versus the problem first approach. You know, problem first approach means that you can probably make do with what you have and, you know, you can try and solve a problem. And if that problem is really unsolvable, then you can go and ask for a technology. But then the dynamics of EO is working in a way that we always go technology first and then we try and see what are the problems we can solve with that technology. So hopefully we don't run into the same kind of problem with this VLEO side uh, because, you know, that that was, again, the case before that, you know, we had a lot of technologies and now we are trying to figure out what to do with this data. So hopefully we don't do that with VLEO, but but I do think that there is some basis for it in some, some uh, sectors like defense. Okay, and this is a very nice segue to the um, intelligence layer. We'll come back to the dissemination layer at, at the end, if you don't mind. So the intelligence layer, I'm saying this is a nice segue because a lot of the things you just mentioned, which is basically, you know, understanding what problem you're solving and who the real end customers are and what their demand is, that, that obviously fits into the intelligence layer. So where do you see that at the moment, sort of which end industries and customers which use cases are interesting and and where do we sit on the let's say let's call it the adoption curve that you know to, to what extent have various end users various uh, end user sectors adopted space technology and specifically your technology uh, i think it's it's very different across different industries right like if you look at uh, yeah i don't want to go to defense but defense has been using it for decades now sure. and it's a similar case with agriculture but agriculture was using it on a you know on an on demand basis uh, agriculture and oil and gas uh, or energy so they used it on a very on demand basis um, along with insurance i see that as you know the main markets so to say and then there's of course the environmental angle angle to it which is more project based and you know let's say sponsorship or grant based which is always going to continue and you know the uptake is always going to be there because eo data is scientifically very very important but going to the markets i i do see that insurance is an area that is picking up a lot these days simply because of you know the kind of times you're living in uh, with respect to disaster risk parametric insurance climate risk as well so all those you know let's say if you put all of that in the financial services bucket that's the let's say the, the big hope for earth observation is that this industry kind of realizes the amount of data that we're going to have in the next uh, few years you know the type of data um, i mentioned earlier uh, infrared or um, emissions or whatever it is and trying to make sense of all this i think that's where you know the role of the downstream companies comes into the picture because the the so-called space companies you know they they can get vertically integrated but you know the level of integration they get to uh, is going to be important because you have mm-hmm. companies like climate cell or tomorrow.io um, they are coming in from their own company it's like we have a company we have a problem we want to solve it uh using space and you know they kind of solve it so you know the intelligence layer does not really apply to them because they are their own customer but then you know you have other types of data like emission data you have um, ghg sat uh, as an example or planet which just you know wanted to also uh, build um the emission satellites so they they come in and making that sense of data making that making sense of that data for the financial services industry is going to be very important because you know one thing is to have a technology and you know another thing is to make use of it so that's where the the push needs to happen from the push and pull needs to happen from both ends because one side push is probably not going to help because then it would become more of a yeah outbound service like uh, sales which is not really great because they don't then internalize what EO can do for them. So the financial services is, again, a very interesting market. I see a lot of focus on agriculture as well, uh, because agriculture, you know, like I mentioned, used to be very on-demand use of EO data. They're probably including it more in a scalable way, a sustainable way going forward. And another one is, hopefully it will pick up again. I think it's probably linked to the ES, the financial services side is, is the ESG and um, climate mm-hmm. risk and all that. Because um, you see, you know, institutions like uh, BlackRock saying that they want to have their portfolio decarbonized and, you know, have track their sustainability metrics um, and all that. And we all know that your data can play a part. A lot of use cases from, you know, from very basic uh, tracking of emissions to uh, building indexes based on sustainability metrics, all that can be done. But would you really call that Earth observation? I think that's kind of where uh, I have questions of where do we draw the line? It's a question of what uh, we have about, uh, you know, Uber and, uh, uh, you know, all the GPS-based companies. Are they space companies? And, you know, that's kind of where I start to ponder if those are all Earth observation companies, because if you're 
building a sustainability index for uh, BlackRock using EO data while also using other sources of data? Do you still fall under Earth observation or, you know, what are you, you know, that's, a, that's yeah. an interesting but conversation. That's, that's an interesting, I mean, it's, it's close to our hearts, right? Because very often as space, well, quote unquote, space specialized investors, right? Our investors and potential investors ask us how we define a space company. And at least for the moment, I think this will continue. We definitely include the EO intelligence companies. I mean, at least assuming that a material part of the data that the company processes comes from satellite data and then maybe they mix it with some other, you know, like terrestrial sensors and some other things. But if it's a material part that's coming from satellites, we would include it. And I guess where the way I'm looking at it, or one way I'm looking at it is that, uh, you know, part, part of my educational background is, is in machine learning. And, you know, from the beginning on, we've always learned that in machine learning, um, the what we call the domain expertise so actually understanding the context of your data is is very important sort of how your data is generated and, and and all of that so i do think that you know understanding what space data can do how the data is collected you know sort of understanding the census a little bit has some role but let me ask you this which is i guess is a related question so if if you for a startup team for a downstream or sorry intelligence application i mean what do you think that should look like do you think that is it more important to have space people data science people people who understand the target sector or all of the above? It depends. I mean, if it's a, you know, let's say if it's a vertically integrated space company, um, you know, the verticalization trend that I was talking about, like companies that are building their products around a specific vertical, if that's the case, I think, well, it's it's kind of, you know, I wrote in a blog post saying, how do you build a unicorn company in EO? Uh, it's an unproven guide. And I think that the first yeah. thing that comes to mind is, of course, you know, what kind of problem you're working with. And the second thing is, of course, the team because i believe like in the in the ideal team uh you know one thing is to have it in theory and the second thing is how it applies practically but theoretically speaking i would i would imagine that there needs to be one of each one person who understands the space side of things very well or the satellite side of things very well so that then he can go and organize the space side of things and then the second person more on the vertical focus so if it's going to be financial services uh, or energy or agriculture whatever it is so that's number two and number three is more the software person um you know who knows mm -hmm. machine learning deep learning or how to build a build a software stack because these are all going to be important in kind of getting the product out so this is kind of the perfect combination for me, but I don't know if any of the successful uh, startups today have that, which means that uh, probably my theory does not hold and it's only in theory, but it's, it's, these are, this is kind of the three perfect team that I would look for. And even if I'm going to, you know, become an entrepreneur in the future, this is kind of the that I would have because you, I think it's important to include all these people from the very beginning to build a, build a solution that makes sense. Because if the founding team or, you know, the first team is just space people, then they build a product out and then let's say they hire um, someone for sales or someone for, with energy or whatever domain knowledge they want, uh, they can come in and contribute in the sales part, but they are not going to contribute in the building part. Maybe the the industry does not really need this type of data, or maybe this industry needs this type of data, but they don't want the data. They they want it in analytics. So, you know, if you're building a company just based on selling the data into a specific sector, and then, you know, once you build a satellite, you find out that, you know what, they're actually going to consume analytics, then you kind of need to go and pivot. Um, so I think if you want to do that from the beginning, this is something that comes to mind, but uh, I don't know, it's just theor theoretical for now. So I can't say it's yeah. a proven method. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, certainly something I agree with you that theoretically, or let's call it prescriptively, I would... As an investor, I would like to see that more. I think dis descriptively speaking, and, and you know, that's just, just reality, the majority of EO, including on the intelligence side, startups um, still founded by space people, you know, who basically know the technology, but not necessarily know the target sector that much. So let me ask you about vertical integration, because you've mentioned it. And I think when you mentioned vertical integration and sort of like, you know, if you, Talking from the perspective of, of an intelligence layer company, then vertical integration, you probably meant sort of um, backward integration, sort of like, well, you could be vertically integrated in the sense that you also own the, the space assets. Now, at least for some use cases, there is also another type of interesting 
theoretical vertical integration, which you know I'd call forward integration, that y- you could actually try to do more in your chosen target sectors. Let, let's take the insurance sector as an example. I mean, you could try to basically sell intelligence or insights to an insurance company, but maybe you know, you're hitting the situation, which I think is still pretty common for the time being, that the people in the target sector, they don't fully understand what's going on with that space data stuff. And um, it might be a, a slog of a sale. And there might be opportunities for you to just basically become a product provider yourself, you know, which I've seen now a few business plans where they basically say, well, instead of selling to insurance companies, we're just going to like write, we're going to use the better data to write insurance products ourselves. Is that also like a trend you you see and what do you think? Yeah, definitely. I mean, especially if they have the right team and they understand, you know, who they are selling to, I think it definitely makes a lot of sense. And that's where, you know, I'm known to, known to making like a, a lot of uh, shameless predictions. And one of them that I did, mm. I don't know if it's happening is, in, in some cases it's happening on a case-by-case basis is this forward, uh, let's say integration happens on a very vertical basis. So for example, there's a company called called um, Cape Analytics in the US and they do property insurance. And, Mm -hmm. you know, you don't really typically call them an EO company because they are an insurance company, which happens to use EO data. And they do partner with financial services product companies and offer their solution in the back end. So, you know, nobody knows that their product is being used, but people still use EO data um, at the end, except that, you know, they probably wouldn't know that EO data is giving them this insight. Um, So that's, you know, one side of things. Another example is uh, companies that are partnering with big enterprise software companies like an SAP or an Oracle, uh, you know, companies already use uh, an IBM or an Oracle or an SAP today. And if uh, an EO company were to partner with them and offer their product as as just one of the features in the SAP module, you know, the customer wouldn't need to know uh, that it's uh, space and it's coming. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is the sensor and data. They can just use it the way they're using, and you know, they just pay for that specific feature. And that's kind of how the startup can make money. So I. I kind of predicted that would happen. I don't know if it has happened fully. So that's one way of doing it, right? Like you go, you say that uh, you you just tell yourself that, you know what, uh, we can only do up to one level. After that, we go and do the partnership. And the second type is what you're saying, right? They kind of build the product themselves and start offering it directly to customers. And I think for that, I think I, I definitely see that happening. And I think it's, it's just dependent on the team and the willingness to go all in. You know, it's a question of going, uh, you know, going back to my computer science roots because my work is in software and I think you would understand uh, breadth first versus depth first. Yeah. Uh, which one do you want to focus on? If you want to go depth first and go all in, you need to go all in because you need to go and conquer that market. And uh, being in that market, then you might have competitors that you have no idea about because, you know, let's say you go into the insurance space, you'll you'll hear of competitors that you're not used to because you come from the space world and, and you kind of need to go and, you know, fight in that game and are you ready to go depth first or are you happy to be, you know, breadth first, you know, which is not wrong, right? It's uh, mm-hmm. both uh, both search uh, approaches are good if you're a computer programmer, depending on uh, whatever problem you're trying to solve. So I think it applies to EO as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, and let's finish up with the last layer uh, quickly, which is the, what do you call it? Dissemination layer, where mm-hmm. basically it's about how does the, the data get distributed, the space data get distributed to the end customers? How do you see that model evolving? Well, part of that, I think I, I kind of, put that into two components. One component is the infrastructure part, which is mostly the cloud um, operators in Europe. It's the Copernicus Deasis. Uh, there are five of them. And then, you know, globally speaking, there are there's AWS and Google and all that. And, you know, all of, of course, the, this happens through partnerships. You know, AWS cannot go it alone. AWS partners with Maxar and Spire and I think Planet partners with Google Cloud. So, of course, they go hand in hand with the data, data suppliers. Uh, they have, uh, you know, exclusive partnerships or in Google's case, like an uh, investment in Planet, you know, some, something like that. So that 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 is the layer that's always going to be there because, you know, you need uh, these cloud operators anyway to, to process and store the data. Uh, and I think the interesting thing happens in the, the platform and the marketplace layers. You know, it started with companies like Skywatch, uh, who kind of just aggregated different sources of data and provided all of them in in one product which you know which is a very useful product like uh, again like up 42 as well they're all doing this where they're offering all of that in in one interface so that people don't have to worry about talking to five different companies for getting five types of data so they make the user's job easy and i think what would probably also happen in the future is you know again going back to my software roots i hope that there's something like an 
Eclipse or an Xcode, like a like a developer environment where people can log in and kind of start playing around with, which is what Google is trying to do with Google Earth Engine. And I hope that there's a lot more to come in this because this is what's going to make satellite data more easy to access because clearly there are, I don't know, I think I track uh, close to 100 companies now and it's crazy, getting crazy with respect to the type of data available, right? You're going to be very confused about what is the type of data, you know, what kind of resolution it is, what format it is. Um, that's where I think the, the work of analysis ready data comes in very handy because as a user, especially if you're coming to use satellite data to build an application to solve your problem, you don't need to worry about hundreds of factors like orbit, resolution, yeah. radiometry. It's it's going crazy, right? So I think hope I hope that there's going to be you know the the startup idea that I would want to see is like I, I mean I'm sure you've used Eclipse or Xcode in your programming uh, life, mm-hmm. um, and and I hope that there's something like that for EO because you know Earth Engine is the equivalent that comes to mind. But if there's a startup that's trying to do that, that's that's golden, especially in the right way. If they can convince all the satellite data operators to kind of partner with them because then it makes everybody's job easy, right? Even seeing what kind of imagery is available on June 7th, 2021, you can't do it with one interface today, right? It's 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 increasingly becoming possible, but it's a very simple, you know, requirement from a user. It's like Hey, something happened yesterday in Paris. I want to see what kind of imagery is available. Mm -hmm. Today, that problem takes so long to solve. To be honest, this is not a very hard problem at all, right? They have built satellites and sent it to space. (laughs) All the customer is asking is, can I see what imagery is available on 7th of June? And I don't think we have an answer today, right? So these are all like simple fundamental things, hopefully that can be solved on the dissemination side, which is very going to be very useful for making EO data to be uh, used more. Yeah, so, I mean, so a couple of follow-up questions on that. I mean, and, and by the way, I fully agree with you. So I guess that means, I mean, there are some existing, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, let's call them like data warehouse or, you know, data supermarket EO data supermarket companies out there, right? Like the one in Canada, which I'm blanking on the name now. I watch, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. Um, so, so I guess you're saying this this is not as good as it could be yet. Uh, it is. I think they will probably get better. I'm, I'm talking about much more visual. You know, it's it's still limited to people who I think who are expected to know. Uh, what they want as opposed to it's not very intuitive so if i have to convince you know i come from the software world and i get all types of questions from my friends about uh, hey i'm working on this problem can you tell me satellite data is useful and i'm saying yes and then he asks uh, okay how do i access it is it available you know very basic questions you know the things that i uh, told so i want this for specific date range uh, and i want to then uh, to be integrated into my workflow so that i can just start you know developing my application so that's the very basic questions that he's asking mm-hmm. today i don't think the industry is in a position to answer that type of question he needs mm-hmm. to be a geospatial expert who has worked with some kind of satellite data before in order to make use of it um, which is a good starting point because now it's starting to be available with solutions like skywatch but i think in order to convince people like my friend who are basically going to be the end market because not everybody is going to be a geospatial expert uh you know space data expert who knows about resolution and orbits and all that so to in order to make it easier for uh, him or her i think that's kind of where this platform that i'm talking about uh can make it useful and i think i, I go back to the android example of how android made it super easy for anybody to come in to start developing applications uh if you kind of need like an android framework for eo i think but uh, but that's more of like you know like a far off thought than like an actual um requirement you know like if, if you have something like a framework of android where anybody can come in and start developing applications applications um, using EO data. That's kind of like the end goal. But I think we, I don't know if there's a requirement for that, but in my head, it sounds like, uh, oh, that would be good to have. We certainly, certainly as um, the developer in me really likes the idea, something that also has really easy APIs. So you can like immediately plug it into like, I don't know, Python or R or whatever you use. Yeah. <laughs> that would be quite nice. So fin- finishing off on the whole EO discussion. So is there, um, across all of the you know, acquisition and, and dissemination and intelligence, is there any sort of like really good um, example, like a success case that springs to your mind? Well, I work with quite a few of them, so I don't want to be very biased and just sure. you know highlight one or two of them. But um, what I do like is what's going on with the, you know, the verticalization that I mentioned. I really like that. And, you know, it starts with a problem. And uh, and I like companies that start with solving a problem. Of course, there are a lot of big companies, successful companies around the world in different industries that just, you know, happen to start and then, you know, they found their way. I think Airbnb comes to mind or 
even I think uh, Uber comes to mind, like they, they did not like start with like, let's solve this problem and let's solve it this way. They just, you know, experimented and pivoted and kind of found their best way. So, but what I do see with EO that's happening a lot is starting with problems and linking the technology to problems. You know, we saw that with few infrared companies recently, emissions uh, companies, they are focusing on the technology. Yes, infrared satellites are available, infrared sensors are available that can be put into space. Uh, emission sensors are available that can be put into space, but they are linking to a problem from the very beginning beginning. They're also thinking about the end user market already, meaning, okay, emission data is quite hard to understand. So we probably need to build an analytics product. And they are already thinking of that from the very beginning, right? So that's not, that seems kind of encouraging because you kind of want to have companies that can have go to market that is easy. You know, you don't want companies where, you know, they take a couple of years to get the satellite out, get the data ready, and then they figure out, you know what, the actual end customer has no way because he's probably not even, you know, digitalized yet. You know, think of industries like mining. Mining are industries that are just getting digitalized, meaning they are just starting to, you know, use digital systems in their business workflow. And then you go and give them a data uh, that is geospatial, you know, how, how can they go and buy it, right? And then there are companies which are starting to think of that already. And they're thinking, you know what, the best go-to-market for the vertical that we are approaching is uh, by giving them an interface with analytics and we're going to go and build that already, right? So I see that companies are already starting to do that. So that's great. And, you know, the vertical specific focus they have is also pretty good because, you know, there's one thing to say, um, we're going to solve a lot of problems, uh, which is, you know, great. But then there's another thing to say, uh, we're going to solve this problem and this is how we're going to solve it with space. So the, the second one seems like a, a very winning strategy as long as they're focusing on the right market, right? It's uh, they're, they're focusing on a problem that has a good addressable market. Uh, you know, they have the team to go ahead and do it. And, and you know, they're, they're going ahead and solving that specific problem. So uh, it's good to, it's, it's, it's a risky strategy, of course, right? So it's good to see companies, uh, a lot of companies around the world take that risk. Okay, let's move away from, from EO. What, in terms of the other activities in, in space sector and really kind of across the board, what just really quickly, what do you find is interesting and why and what do you think is less interesting right now? Uh, you mean in terms of the markets? Yeah, in terms of the market potential, the um, the investment potential, yeah. Um, well, apart from EO, I think what I find super interesting is the in-orbit manufacturing and everything to do with what is called the on-orbit economy. So it, it, it includes things like, you know, satellite uh, servicing and debris removal, as well as manufacturing in orbit. I think all of them, I put all the three together and all the three of them are I think super important problems to solve. And, you know, I got into the space industry a few years ago. And I mean, of course I like space and all, but I think the, the reason I got into the space industry was because it was, you know, the industry where, you know, one can have the most significant impact by working on a technologically complex problem. And all the three problems I mentioned are super important problems and also technologically complex problems, right? Like removing debris or um, servicing satellites and having fuel stations in space uh, or, manufacturing you know things in orbit so all of them are super impactful and super technologically complex so i'm super excited about all three of them and of course i think um, i may be biased because of the interest in lunar economy because i just finished a project but i think there's a lot of things to do with respect to you know the, both technologically and commercially to solve with respect to the moon and you know what we're going to do there and yeah so those are let's say the two areas that I'm focusing on, especially given that I think we have six to eight missions coming up in the next two years to the moon. Mm. So it's going to be super exciting uh, to the moon. So I'm yeah, it looking can get forward to that pretty as well. Busy, pretty quickly, probably more quickly than people realize. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I mean, it's, it's like the first one will fly and it's going to be soon the second and the third one. And uh, yeah, I think it's something that a lot of people not realizing right now how quickly this might happen. And um, on, on the flip side, anything you're you're less, less excited about? Well, I won't say I'm less excited about, but I let, let's say the, let's say the industry take care of itself and I'm not really paying much attention is the whole communication side of things um the um well iot is a market that i don't know much about but i do know that you know 
a lot of companies are working on this problem. Uh, so I can't comment on, you know, if they have a very good commercial potential, market potential, and same goes with the internet providers. You know, what if we have like five, six companies and countries working on their own internet constellation pro satellites uh, from Starlink to, you know, SpaceX, uh, sorry, to, to Amazon, to OneWeb, and, you know, countries like EU, China, uh, they also want to have their own constellations. And it's an area that I see the point, uh, but I don't know if there's going to be so if there's a need for so much focus on it, given that, you know, it's not like space is the only way to solve that problem. Uh, in some places, yes, but not for all around the world, right? It's, uh, I see that, you know, different parts of Africa and, you know, I come from India and I know that some parts of India can definitely benefit. Uh, but the, the question is, yeah, is there going to be enough uh, return for people? Can, you know, can a country like India... Um, do work with only satellites the way they are pitching um, maybe it needs to be a hybrid solution maybe not so i think it's it's a little more complex and the reason that uh, i won't say i'm less excited about it but the reason it's probably not that straightforward is because yeah it's it's not the it's not the um, it's not as simple as they are saying you know, it's not, you know, launch the satellite and then internet is going to be available. And especially in a country like India, where I think there are tens of thousands of people living in one square kilometer, can satellites, can I guarantee if everybody is watching Netflix, uh, you know, things like that. I don't know if the answer is so straightforward. I mean, I don't know if that's uh, a reasonable uh, question to have, but I don't know if satellites can only solve that problem or I don't know where we are in terms of the whole communications game and satellites being the only answer to to solve that problem yeah no agreed so why are you mentioning india that's actually let, let me ask you this because um another interesting question is sort of like which locations are interesting for space right now and obviously the, the you know the standard answer is the, the us is sort of the most important location and continues to be for space at the moment but what do you think about some of the things which are which are happening in india now with the iso opening up to or seemingly opening up to commercial activities and i think just last month we had i think on the same day even two financing rounds for Mm -hmm. for two rocket companies in india well it's it's a uh, good times right like I, when i was in india i think when i was growing up i wouldn't even you know see space news as much and it's only when nasa launches a big mission that uh, space is being talked about if not or is through us uh, and you know there's not a lot of talk so it's great to see that that's uh, happening especially with i think three we had three pixel and the two launcher companies agnicole and skyroot getting funded on the same day so it's great times for let's say space um private space uh, in India and given that Israel, Israel is opening up and there's a lot of interest and you know what we have in our country is uh, is people and I think statistically speaking India has you know all the right let's say tools to make it big because you know it has the largest middle class population in the world and a lot of engineers I can say because everybody studies engineering in India so yeah we have the tools and I think I'm super bullish about India um, especially because you know the public bodies are also starting to realize the potential of space. So India is definitely a space that I'm excited about. Um, I'm very excited about what's going on in Africa as well. Uh, I got to you know, speak with a few people on what's going on with Africa and how they approach space. And, you know, I also listened to the episode uh, in your podcast about someone from space in Africa, right? So there's a lot of yeah. potential in, in Africa as well. And and I'm really passionate about the whole downstream side of things and what space can do for Earth. And I can see that there's a lot space can do, you know, starting from connecting people, if space can really do that, you know, going back to the internet example, uh, to the whole applications of Earth observation data and what... Um, yeah applications it can have for africa um, and india so those are all like the, the the things that you know really excite me and you know india and africa are in general the the two markets that i'm excited about i think of course uh you know the eu and us uh and let's say the oceania australia new zealand and japan they get like a lot of media attention india increasingly and i think that uh, africa is going to be an interesting space to watch to see how they approach the whole yeah, space strategy um because at the end of the day for me in a few years i see that space is just going to be like another infrastructure uh, that governments are going to put money on uh, I think we're already seeing that in the US and Canada, like how they're approaching their public investments with um, internet. They are just looked at as another infrastructure, uh, like building roads or building bridges or, you know, any other type of infrastructure. So in the long term, uh, I'm really kind of excited about how 
India and Africa would approach space overall as as a as a public uh, policy and how they approach it as an infrastructure and what kind of applications they they invest in. You know, they can invest in building infrastructure within their own country or they can invest in you know uh, lunar missions or the lunar economy as well going forward but yeah i'm really excited about these two let's say regions yeah agreed agreed okay let me finish up and i'll finish up um basically <laughs> i'm gonna steal your idea because i thought it was such a, a, a brilliant question what's your one line statement um, to the space community oh okay I, i was not prepared for this maybe i should have just prepared for this <laughs> you question. should have been <laughs> the big message or you know the kind of learning that i have in the last years or so in the space industry is how kind of closed and exclusive it has been and even After coming in, I had to, let's say, put in 10 times the effort to learn everything, to understand how everything works. And I mean, yes, it is complex because, you know, it's all about space. And, you know, like you said, you need to put in your 10,000 hours of work uh, to understand how the industry works and how to kind of understand how to contribute for us as, as an individual coming from other sectors. The, the message is more on the lines of, you know, make it easier to understand for folks outside the space industry or what i call the space bubble and and yeah be open i say i think i think that's kind of how i would approach it uh, be open both in terms of getting people in but also getting learnings in from other industries yes space is you know new and exclusive and exciting and of course very complex but it doesn't mean that uh, you cannot learn from other industries like um, you know agile comes to mind agile is a very software oriented thing but then you know now it's certainly translated into the space industry uh, like that. I'm sure there are plenty of other processes and methodologies and frameworks that we can learn from other industries. But, you know, for that, we also need to kind of get people in as well and make them understand what's going on so that they'll be able to contribute better. And it also applies, you know, also from a whole global nationality uh, diversity basis because space is again, very global, but also it's kind of the future of humanity. So when I say be open, it also means to, to get a lot more countries into into deciding the future of humanity yes. as opposed to only a few countries because you know it's not deciding between a small mine in australia that you know a g7 can decide or putting a tax on company that a g7 can decide this is like the future of humanity right so i think um, as many countries and as many people need to be involved if then when we're making the big decision. That's kind yeah. of what I mean by be open. I, I agreed. And since, since we are having some of these, uh, sometimes we have this utopia and science fiction of, you know, the world kind of working all together on space, like in Star Trek, the Federation. <laughs> this is a nice segue to the, the sci-fi question. And uh, Aaron, do you like sci-fi? And if so, what kind of sci-fi do you like? Well, to be honest, uh, I think I'm one of the very few people in the space industry who has not watched Star Trek or Star Wars or anything like that. So it makes me go, want to go and check it out. But no, I do like uh, space fi sorry, sci-fi in general. Um, I think one of the biggest reasons or one of the biggest, biggest factors that I got into the space industry was um, after I had watched Interstellar. Uh, mm. And I think that kind of had a very important influence of how I approached the space industry. That's when I realized, you know what, because I took a course to understand the movie. And that's kind of how I was obsessed with the movie. Mm -hmm. I was I took a course on black holes and, uh, and you know, to understand what's and relativity and things like that to understand what's going on in the movie. So mm -hmm. when I saw the movie is when I realized, you know what, I'm the only one out of all my friends who took course to understand the movie. So maybe I need to, you know, put more thoughts into working in the space industry. And that's kind of one of the reasons why I got into the industry. So um, that's that's one of my biggest, uh, let's say, inspirations or, you know, factors in, in sci-fi. And um, I also like Battlestar Galactica for, for different reasons, but sci-fi being one of them. Um, so it's nice to think of a world like that and kind of escape and sci-fi. I think allows people to escape that. But other than that, you know, non-space related, I, I I enjoy everything from you know cyberpunk to to the whole AI based ex machina like movies uh, that mm -hmm. um, you know that kind of give a realistic take. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the whole superhero movie um, genre, which kind of falls into mm -hmm. sci-fi in some uh, in some movies. But you're not a huge, huge fan of fan of that. But but yeah. Uh, general realistic take on sci-fi uh, that's something is what I enjoy okay well I, I think Interstellar is a is a fantastic example and, and anybody who's listening who hasn't seen it yet I really recommend you'd watch it um, it's like you say they, they try to stay very close to the science I mean 
the scientific advisor to the movie was Kip Thorne, the mm-hmm. Stanford physicist. So the yeah. science there is... Yeah, just, to, just to finish the story, I also yeah. read, uh, sorry, got the book after I watched the movie. Uh, it was called The Making of the Interstellar to understand the movie yeah. better. So I think I'm still on my quest to understand everything uh, about the movie. <laughs> so I've done, I think I've done all you can to understand the movie uh, from a scientific uh, point of view, including talking to a few uh, astronomers and cosmologists to understand the movie better. But yeah, that's kind of my obsession with the movie. Yeah, and then I was going to say the, the other sort of um, like it was a nice thing about the movie is that, I mean, the, the reason, I mean, without giving too many spoilers, but the reason they travel to space is basically because of a calamity that has happened on Earth. And so it's kind of, again, bringing in this element that, you know, we, we may need space sort of for, for the salvation or the safeguarding of humanity, which of course is a you know, common theme at the moment that many people believe in, including including Elon. Mm-hmm. Erwin, thank you very much for, for being a guest and this very interesting conversation. And and I'm sure we're going to do this again at some point in time and sort of look back to, you know, how our some of our predictions have come through or, or not. Absolutely. Yeah. Looking forward to seeing all my shameless predictions, you know, fail. It was fun, fun, Rafael. Thanks. Thanks for chatting. <laughs> thanks. Well, that's it for another nominal episode of the Space Business Podcast. If you like this podcast, please consider giving it a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform, such as iTunes. You can follow us on Twitter at podcast underscore space. Also consider supporting us at www.patreon.com forward slash space business podcast. If the podcast got you interested in learning more about the business opportunities in the space economy, check out my new online course on space entrepreneurship on udemy.com. The link is in the episode description. Lastly, if you have any feedback, including ideas for guests, And that may include yourself if you have an exciting space story to tell or interested in being a sponsor. Drop us an email at spacebusinesspodcast at gmail.com. I look forward to seeing you for the next episode.